Welcome to Comics on a Pyre, a channel to have a meaningful conversation over movies, life, books, and shows, and maybe just a spot to spend time BSing over comics. If you like your entertainment with a bit of substance, then you, my vagabond friend, have come to the right tavern. Tether your horse by the post, then come right on in and warm yourself by the fire. Tap that subscribe button, and for the next few minutes, my fellow George Carlin reprobate, lend me your ear. Recently, I got the urge to reread the first Secret Wars miniseries. You know, the one released way back in 1984. But in doing so, like always, I debated over the best way of approaching the read-through. Should I just pick up the single issues and reread them all like I did the first time back in the old days? Or should I pick up an omnibus to discover the tidbits of information that I missed the first time around? The only problem with the extra issues of information and such is that you tend to read whole issues on stories that don't even pertain to the plot line. And this wind up being a waste of your time just to get a few minor panels concerning your series. Well, I'm glad to tell you that I found a happy medium. A place where you can have your cake and eat it too. And it is right here in this paperback of Secret Wars. It is the third edition of the Collector Series and released in 2011. You see, if you just read Secret Wars single issues, issue one just starts out with all the heroes collected already aboard the Beyonders vessel. But in this edition, you get a brief story on how Earth's mightiest heroes got there. It may not be much, but I believe it adds to the story. And I am a completionist of some sort. And if I'm going to read a story, give me all the details. Therefore, I will not be lost on some reference alluded to later on in the story. The book starts out with Marvel's flagship character, Spider-Man. He tells the reader that for days now, his spider sense has been going haywire. And it is now, finally, that he is able to pinpoint the source of this strange and ominous toxin. It just happens to be in Central Park. Upon approaching the source of the signal, he encounters a mysterious structure that he hilariously calls Futuristic Stonehenge. He notes that its presence here is strange, but a strong, eldritch premonition has called him here, and against his better judgment, he enters the structure, just to be absorbed in a flash of light and vanish into thin air. But he is just the first of many to come. In Uncanny X-Men number 180, Charles Xavier and his students are returning from a mission abroad. Charles states that for weeks now, he has been experiencing waves of psychic powers coming from Central Park. Since he is now in New York, he feels that this is a good time to investigate its source. When they too enter the structure through the, one of its portals, a flash of light is seen and they too vanish into thin air, as if they never existed at all. The same thing happens to Jim Rhodes in Iron Man 181. Hawk, an Incredible Hawk, issue 294, to three of the Fantastic Four members in The Thing, issue 10, and to a select group of Avengers in Thor 341, Avengers 242, and in Captain America 292. In each of the last three issues referenced, though, it is the same group of Avengers that entered the Beyonder structure and get teleported away, leaving the remaining Avengers to surmise as to their team's fate. Now, one thing I wanted to note, and it's not pertinent to the story, but can we address two things here? One, what the hell is going on with She-Hulk's fingers here? I mean, her hands look like it belongs to the Grinch that stole Christmas. And two, now, just, now this just might be me and my dirty mind, but can we address what Vision says to She-Hulk while the whole team is standing outside the futuristic structure known as Stonehenge? He states, mm, let me say, I wouldn't kid about a thing like this, She-Hulk. Your handheld detectors are all connected via direct link to my master unit. Now, if I said this to a woman, I feel as though 
I will be getting slapped any minute. But hey, like I said, my mind wanders into places it shouldn't. And anyway, let's continue. Now that we are finished with the prologue, we could begin with the issue of One of Secret Wars, where we would have started if it not for the prologue of the Omnibus. Somewhere in a galaxy far, far from Earth, a strange dome technological structure just spontaneously appears. And on it, we find Earth's mightiest heroes. The only problem is that they, with all of their collective knowledge and might, do not know themselves on how they got there. After a short roll call, it is Captain America that points out that their craft is not alone in this part of the empty space. There is another similar structure that orbits them in close proximity. The only difference is that aboard the other craft is a rogue gallery of Marvel's most heinous villains. The Finn quickly points out to his fellow heroes that if the other ship harbors bad guys, then why is Magneto here and not among their ranks? I find this point myself interesting, Bureau. As me personally, I'd never felt Magneto was a bad guy. He just protects his species by any means necessary. Yes, he has killed people, but so has Wolverine, and no one tells that little runt to lead the ship. Anyway, the professor quickly squashes the argument, and none too soon. Within eyesight of both vessels, a cosmic event of massive proportions unfolds. An entire galaxy is being destroyed and rebuilt in front of their very eyes. Shards of planets and continents of shelves are being rearranged to consummate into one whole planet by a force totally unnatural. The feat is so awe-inspiring that at least even the dreaded Dr. Doom a gasp. Then, as if on cue, Ultron out of nowhere decides to attack his fellow villains simply for the fact that they are humans, as if he didn't notice this before. The next scene is both hilarious and telling of Doom's nature. In the presence of certain death, Victor tells Molecule Man to stop Ultron, but it seems that Molecule Man has given up a life of crime and wants nothing to do with it. He states that his therapist told him not to hurt anyone. Now that's funny. One of the strongest beings in the Marvel Universe and he goes to a therapist, <laughs> I tell you. Anyway, Doom convinces Molecule Man to hurl Ultron into Galactus. Now, can we stop right here and just recognize Galactus is on this ship. I mean, he is a world devourer, the ender of planets, a celestial being, and he was teleported on this ship. I assume against his will. If that doesn't tell you on just how strong the Beyonder is, I don't know what will. Anyway, upon noticing Ultron's presence, the Atomantium robot is hefted up into Galactus' face. Ultron, being Ultron, continues to talk smack to Galactus until the celestial being decides to have none of it. In an instant, one of the Avengers' most powerful foes is dealt with as easily as one would blow out a candle. Well said, Power Driver. Just then, a rift in the vacuum of space opens up and a celestial light showers down on both the vessels. An ethereal voice cascades into each being's ears, stating, I am from beyond. Slay your enemies, and all you desire shall be yours. Nothing you dream of is impossible for me to accomplish. Now this is where it gets even more interesting for me. Galactus, a being that has scoured the cosmos, vouches for the Beyonder, stating that he feels the Beyonder's powers and that he knows what he is saying is true. Now here you get a rare glimpse on what Galactus truly wants. He doesn't want to be a world devourer. He, kidders, he considers his hunger a sickness and he wants to be rid of it. Much like a vampire with a conscience, he wishes as though he did not have to continue killing to survive. What happens next is surprising. Galactus, a being almost as old as time itself, hurls himself towards the Beyonder. He is like an impetuous youth, one not able to control himself. 
And once again, we see Dr. Doom hot on the Celestial's heels, hoping for an opportunity to capitalize on Galactus' impetuousness. But it seems that the Great Beyonder will have none of it, and he casts both Doom and Galactus down as if they were dry grain before the scythe. The powerful act lets the remaining heroes and villains know just how powerful a being they are dealing with. Afterwards, the two vessels are swept away and each land at a different location on a newly formed planet. After much debate on their next course of actions, it is decided that Captain America is to be their leader, but not all are in accord. Meanwhile, at a third location, Von Doom recovers from his recent folly, but it seems Galactus, Galactus took the brunt of the blow and is still in slumber. After a cursory survey of the landscape, Doom decides that a nearby structure is his best bet. Upon entering it, Victor debates with his fellow conspirators over the best course of action. They want to defeat their opponents to gain the prize of their heart's desire. But, as usual, Doom sees the bigger picture. He tells them why beg at the table for the master's scraps, hanging on to his whim, when you have the potential to seize the very power of your heart's desire yourself. Realizing the futility of his words, seeing that he is casting pearls before swine, Doom levels the structure, allowing himself enough time to abscond from the scene, unaccosted. The direness of the situation makes Doom realize that, though he hates to admit it, there is just one person that can fathom the severity of the situation, and that person is Reed Richards. Swiftly, the Fantastic Four's greatest nemesis, mounts a ship and spurs himself forward to find Mr. Fantastic. But the whole time, Kang was eavesdropping on Doom's monologue. And it serves him right anyway for talking out loud. I mean, why does he do that? Brother, chew you with your mouth closed. Not everyone needs to see what you're eating. Anyway, Kang fires off a surface-to-air blast, blowing a good doctor <laughs> right out of the sky. Man, Doom is not having a good day in his first issue. Our heroes, hearing the blast, decide to investigate the noise, and what they find is a weakened and weary Doom. Still, though, a snake is most dangerous when it's dead, and so Victor rejects their offer of help and blasts them with a ray from his gauntlets. See, Cap? No good deed goes unpunished. What follows could not have been better planned for the bad guys. A field littered with heroes all dazed and hazed. Well, that's the end of this omnibus prologue and Marvel Superhero Secret War issue number one. If you like what you saw, then by all means, visit my comic book, YouTube channel, Comics on the Pyre for other videos like this one. Tap on that bell icon before you go. And oh yes, as always, until next time, keep reading my friend.